Thanks, Keegs. And thanks to, before we get started, thanks to all of you guys for giving up your time today um, and coming down and making not only yourselves better, but also all of the athletes that you coach better as well. Um, I know that it's Sunday morning. I'm sure we've probably all got places where we'd much rather be, but I feel coming to these things and really investing in it in yourself is going to be such a big payoff, not only because you grow in confidence with what you're trying to do, um, but also that reflects pretty, pretty heavily onto your athletes as well. And they're going to get a whole lot more out of you guys being here today. So thank you for doing that. Um, I was going to give a bit of an introduction, but Keeg's kind of ticked it all off as well. Um, lucky enough to be with the Wildcats now as one of their video coaches. Um, essentially, I started where you guys started. Started off coaching domestic, my younger brother's domestic team, then moved up into Wobble, started doing some Wobble stuff. Was lucky enough to be a development coach on a state team, um, which then really started to, I guess, ignite the fire for coaching. Um, and then that turned into, as Keith mentioned, I did a little bit of stuff with the Australian wheelchair team that moved into SBL, started being an SBL assistant coach. Um, and I'm now lucky enough to do this full time. So have worn lots of different hats. And I can honestly say that you guys are the most important ones. And we'll touch on a little bit um, in a bit as to why that is. But understand that the grassroots basketball coach as much as the state coaches and the pro coaches and those things think they're the most important, uh, it's the grassroots coaches that are 100% the most important coaches going out there. Um, just as a quick show of hands, so I know who here is actively, is anyone here not actively coaching? No, that's fine, cool. Anyone coaching under eights? Yep, couple, tens, coach them all, twelves, fourteens, sixteens, eighteens. Cool, excellent, excellent. I love that. I love that you coach everything. That's awesome. Um, boys and girls, yep. Beautiful, love it. Um, cool. So, Keg's kind of touched on it. What we're going to be speaking about today is just things that you can do as a grassroots coach that's going to help you, that's going to help you, and going to help your athletes. Um, with these things as well, I hate it being like a presentation. If I stand up here and I talk for an hour, you guys are all going to be sick of my voice and I'm going to be sick of talking as well. So I would much rather have a discussion going back and forth. So if you have questions, if you have a point, if you think some of the stuff up here is wrong, please yell it out. Let's have a chat. Let's go from there, okay? Um, also, I find if we're asking questions and I ask a question and everyone sits there blank, it gets really awkward silence after that as well. So please, just let's have a bit more of a discussion rather than a presentation. So we're talking about grassroots coaching and there are some things that are really important to remember um, when you're coaching. And I guess the first one, the biggest and most important thing with being a grassroots coach is make sure your athletes are having fun. That's at the end of the day what it boils down to. The reason why kids come and play basketball is because they love it. And it's your job as a coach to make sure that they're having fun. And... The reason why grassroots coaches are most important is because of that. You think about it, if you coach an under eights, under tens team, you get a really young bunch of athletes. You coach them for what, maybe 45 minutes a week, an hour. If you're really lucky, you get them for an hour and a half or two hours a week. Not a lot of time to really make a difference in terms of what they're doing with their skills. You think about it, you've got them for 45 minutes and you're going to teach them a little bit of dribbling, a little bit of shooting, some defense, you're going to play some games. Hands up who's had athletes that you know go home and forget everything that we've done at practice. Happens all the time. So you can't really have an impact then, can you? If they're just going to forget it. Where you can have an impact is if you make your session fun. Because then your 45 minutes that you get with them they really enjoy that and they go home and they play for another 45 minutes in the backyard. And then the next day they play for another 45 minutes and then the next day another 45 minutes. And they're doing the stuff that you've done at practice, but they're doing it back at home where there's no coaches, no teachers, no parents or brothers and sisters or whatever, they're just doing it. And then all of a sudden your 45 minutes of impact actually turns into three, four, five hours of impact. 
and that's where you can have the biggest um, the biggest influence on them and by helping them fall in love with the game. I was, um, I guess, a bit unique. I only ever played basketball. Didn't play footy, didn't play cricket, didn't, I, from the first time I picked up a basketball at six years old, that was it. And there are, not to say that's the right way of doing things, but that was the way that I went about it. And I can still remember every single one of my domestic coaches, which is really weird because I've had a bunch of them, but I can still remember every single coach I had at a young age and every single one of them had varying types of impact on me. But the common theme was they all helped me fall in love with the game of basketball. I can't remember who taught me how to shoot. Can't remember who taught me how to dribble. But I can remember some of the funnest times of getting in the car. My dad came and picked me up afterwards. And I just talked and talked and talked about what we did at basketball. And then I went home and shot for hours in the backyard. And the dog used to rebound for me and bring the basketball back to me. And they were some of the best times. So as a junior grassroots coach, that should be the number one focus. So making sure that everything you do is fun for your athletes. It's also really important to be a good role model. And especially with younger athletes, they're pretty influential. And after parents, teachers, family, friends, coaches are kind of right up there as well. So we want to make sure that we're a good role model and we're setting a good example. What are some things that you can do as a coach to help set a good example for your athletes? Model good yep, model good behavior. What's an example of that? Yep, not worrying about referees. That's a huge thing. Yep, excellent. What else? Yeah, all around manners. Saying please, saying thank you. Excellent. Yeah, having fun yourself. If we want the athletes to have fun, then we should be having fun as well. After all, we're giving up our time to go and help these guys out. Maybe we should have some fun with it as well. What else? Yep. Yeah. It's a really tough one with coaching. Sometimes we, fo we focus so much on what we're not doing. Oh, you should do this. We didn't do this. You need to do this better. Sometimes it's really difficult to actually stop and go, hey, great job. That's awesome. Let's focus on this rather than this. That's really good. What else? Yeah, turning up on time. Turning up on time is such a big thing, especially in basketball. Basketball is a unique game where time has such a big, time has such, so many different elements in our game. For example, like what are some things that rely on time in a game? What are some examples of time in a game of basketball? I'll give you one. The game goes for 40 minutes normally. What else? Shot clock. How long's the shot clock? Yep, 24 seconds. Excellent. What else? Keyway. How long can you be in there? Three seconds. What else? Back court. How long can you be in the back court? Eight seconds. Five seconds holding the basketball. Excellent. What else? Yep, inbound pass, five seconds. Timeouts, how long? Minute. Minute. Half time, quarter time, overtime. So already there's lots and lots of different elements in the game of basketball that rely on time. And to show how important those elements are, a great way that you can set that example is just by being on time. By being on time sets an importance um, for everything else. So all of those, a couple of other examples um, of ways that you can be a good role model, looking presentable, um, not swearing, the way you treat other people, all of those things are going to be super influential in the way your athletes behave. And I'm a big believer in a team will be a direct reflection of the coach. So I heard Damo talk before, he's a defensive-minded coach. I've seen some of Damo's teams play, and I can tell you right now that they are defensive-minded teams because that's the way that he 
that's what's important to him. How many times have we seen a coach lose their mind at a referee or a decision or something like that, and then all of a sudden all the kids start losing their mind as well? Who's seen that before? Who's also seen the flip side, a coach that's really nice and you like them, and all their kids play the right way and they do the right thing and they're a really nice team. So I'm a big believer in your team will be a direct reflection of you. What you believe is important, your team will believe is important. Okay, so that's another thing that's really important to remember. We want to create an environment where your athletes feel safe. A couple of layers to that. What do we think that one means? Yeah, excellent. We, as coaches, want to encourage our athletes to get outside their comfort zone, don't we? Because that's where lots of mistakes happen, and what, through those mistakes, that's, where, that's how they learn. And we'll speak about that a little bit more when we get to the skills. But it's super important if you as a coach are going to be encouraging your athletes to make mistakes, that the environment around them makes them feel safe to make those mistakes. Okay, and it's a pretty tricky one because if you have an environment where other kids laugh at us, like the kids laugh and back and forth and take the piss out of each other a little bit, then if you're a 10-year-old kid, are you likely to go and try and make a mistake knowing that your teammates are going to take the piss out of you? Probably not. If you as a coach only focus on the negatives and the mistakes, are they likely to try and get outside of their comfort zone to improve themselves? Probably not. So as a coach, it's very, very important that the environment that you create makes the kids feel safe. And that relates back up to the first one as well of them having fun. It's very hard to have fun in an environment where you don't feel safe. Another role of a grassroots coach is probably to teach them something as well. Probably teach them some of the skills. And I heard Damo touched on it a little bit earlier. We're going to go through the Fab Five um, and some different ways that you can teach them the skills. And it's such an important... I'll talk about that later. Not yet. And the last one, anyone know what this means? Keep it simple. Okay? Keep it simple, stupid is what they say. Um... But that's the biggest thing. And this is a trap that I still to this day get caught on and I'm trying to get better and better and better at it. If you have a plan and your plan is this big, cut it to this big. Because one thing I've learned is it's not what you know as a coach, it's what your athletes can do. So if you have a session plan that's this big and you're gonna teach this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, that's all well and good. But if your players can only do this, then this part is irrelevant. So especially early on with a new team, if you're a newer coach, simplify everything that you're trying to do and just focus on that and be really good at that. And then once you get good at that, move to the next phase. And then once you get good at that, move to the next phase as well. And it's a trap because as coaches, we want to help our athletes so much and we have such little time. You know, we've spoken, we probably only get 45 minutes a week not a lot of time to do stuff. So how do we make that 45 minutes the most effective? Do we try and cram everything into it? Or do we keep it simple and just get a few things right? And it's a trap, again, that every single coach gets into at different times. So we'll go through to the Fantastic Five. I don't know, I wasn't here when Damo was speaking about it, but did he touch on as to how the Fantastic Five came up? Who came up with it? What the purpose of it is? All right, cool. So let's think about, forget about that. Don't read that. If you have read it, forgot it, forget it for a second. Let's talk about the game of basketball. What are some skills or some things that you're going to teach in the game of basketball? Passing, perfect. What else? Shooting, excellent. What else? Dribbling, pivoting, defense. What else? Communication. Stance, yep. What happens when a shot goes up? Rebounding. So we could sit here and literally do this for an hour, okay? Lots and lots and lots of different things. Who's ever received one of those skills curriculums or who's ever seen a skills curriculum 
lots of different skills going down and check marks and under 12s, you've got to do this, under 14s, you've got to do this. And it's pretty confusing, isn't it? And if we're trying to keep it simple, how on earth are we going to do that with a curriculum that's this long? So Basketball Australia actually went away and they thought, okay, if we're going to be helping our grassroots coaches become better at what they're trying to do, then we need to simplify it for them. And so they boiled it right back down to the basics. And they said, in the game of basketball, what are the most important things? And they came up with those five. You're pivoting, or I like to call it footwork, your ability to pass the basketball, your ability to dribble the basketball, your ability to shoot the basketball, and the ability to defend one-on-one. -on -one. And you think about the athletes that you coach, and then think about some of the athletes that I'm lucky enough to coach. That's what it boils down to at the end of the day. The team that can shoot the best is generally the team that's going to win. The team that doesn't turn the ball over because they can dribble and because they can pass, generally is going to good, good things are going to happen for them. The team that can defend the basketball one-on-one -on -one is generally going to put themselves in a better, um, in a better situation to win. So... Basketball Australia thought, okay, let's focus on those five things. And they came up with the phrase, the Fantastic Five. And there's a guy, I'm sure some of you guys know him. His name's Peter Lonigan. So he's the head of high performance coaching at Basketball Australia. Um, very, very smart man. If you have the time, go and watch some of his clinics on YouTube. They will change the way that, they will change the way that you coach and you approach coaching. But one of his favorite sayings is, it's not about X's and O's, it's about Johnny and Joe's. And it's a really difficult trap because as coaches, we all want to run a nice looking offense and we want to be our tactics because that's our way of a coach of giving ourselves a little pat on the back. If we say, let's go out and run this play and your athletes go out and run this play, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? How many times have we said, okay, let's try and run this play and then your athletes dribble it off their foot. Or one of your athletes makes a cut and we can't throw the pass to them properly. Or we throw the pass and then we miss the layup. Who's had a situation like that before? Yep, happens to all of us as well. So let's scale it back a little bit. Rather than focus on what the end result is, Let's focus on the skills that are going to help you. And it's a really big trap in coaching. And it's something that I enjoy watching, I guess, the modern coach nowadays. They are actually focusing more on Johnny and Joe's, each individual player and how they do those five things compared to running a nice offense, running a nice trap, doing the team sort of stuff as well. And especially at the grassroots level, that's so important there. I say that... But it's also super, super important at the professional level. So basketball aside, who here takes a daily multivitamin or something like that? Anyone take them? I take vitamins every single morning. Yep. What's the purpose of doing that? What's the purpose of waking up in the morning and taking a vitamin? Yep. Keeps yourself healthy. Gets yourself going. It's a really good routine to be able to get yourself into. We were lucky enough to have a guy, Matt Nielsen, as our assistant coach last year. He spent some time with the San Antonio Spurs. And this is something that he stole from the Spurs. Um, daily vitamins in a basketball sense. And what we essentially do is we have two vitamin sessions before practice and one vitamin session post-practice. And they only go for 20 minutes. And there's basically three assistant coaches at the Wildcats and each of us have our own players that we look after. So I've got the point guards, I've got Damo, Mitch, Bryce, and some of our development guys as well. And essentially during my vitamin sessions, I get one hit with Damo for 20 minutes, one hit with Bryce for 20 minutes, one hit with Mitch for 20 minutes. And then if we have some extra time, we'll get into the development guys or we might pair some guys up and go. And... A vitamin is essentially working on those five things. And the Spurs philosophy is, we spoke about 
It's not about X's and O's. It's about Johnny and Joe's. We want to get our guys so they have really good footwork, so they can all make a correct pass, so they can all dribble under pressure, so they can all shoot, and so they can all defend. So an example of a vitamin with a guy like Bryce might be, we just work on shooting. That's his main skill is he needs to be able to shoot the basketball. So we'll incorporate drills and we'll give him a little 20 minute hit on shooting in different situations that he might see on the weekend in a game. Damo, for example, he's a point, or Damo and Mitch are point guards. So they need to be working on their handles, they need to be working on their passes, and then we'll do certain types of shots with them. With the young fellas, a lot of their areas where they need to improve on is defensively. So we might grab a few of them and we might go and play some one-on-one -on -one for 20 minutes post-practice. And that teaches lots of different um, aspects of the, of the Fantastic Five. And by doing this every single day, it ticks a box. It makes sure that those guys are getting the skill development that they need. So then when Trev comes in for the main session, he doesn't have to worry about making sure that all the guys are getting their ball handling because they're getting that in their vitamins. Doesn't need to go and we still do shoot the ball a lot in our main practice, but he knows that guys are getting individual reps as well, um, which is going to help them continually improve day in, day out. Now, how is this applicable in grassroots? I could pretty much guarantee that none of you guys get access to your athletes every single day. Probably only get them once a week. So how is this applicable to what you guys do? Yep. Perfect. They can go home and practice at home. You can give them certain drills to be doing at home. Now, are they likely to do it every single day? No, of course not, because they're not professional basketballers. That's not their job. They've got school. They've got all these other things going on. How can you help them do it every single day, though? Yep, incentivize it. How so? Yep. Yep, so actually tracking their, their progress and giving them a goal to work on in the next month, in the year, in the week, whatever it may be. Yep, that's really good. Did you have one that you wanted to say? Same sort of thing, yep. Yep. Sorry? Yeah, keep it fun. If you say, all right, I want you to go home and I want you to do 50 defensive slides back and forth. I don't know any of your athletes, but I can guarantee none of them are going to go and do that. If you say, All right, I want you to go home and practice dribbling with your left hand, I can pretty much guarantee that none of your athletes are going to go. Some of them might actually. Most of them won't do that. So you have to, as a coach, put your coaching brain on and figure out how do we make these little activities fun. Okay? How else is the daily vitamins idea, how else can you integrate that into what you're trying to do as a grassroots basketball coach? Yep, small habits lead to big results, absolutely. Yeah, using these guys as examples. And if you can find stories or um, you know, clips or something like that to show where these guys have come from, um, yeah, that's 100% a really good way. Yeah, starting to integrate a vitamin session into your practice plan, which... Again, I saw a couple of demo session plans there and he had bits and pieces of it. But if you get to practice for know, an hour once a week, put 20 minutes of that hour aside for skill development. Put that aside as a vitamin. It doesn't have to be a daily vitamin, it could be a weekly vitamin. But by making sure that you're ticking the boxes um, in that skill development space, it's in the long run going to be helping your athletes immensely. So something there. Um, there's also a really cool article 
on, we'll speak about resources and stuff afterwards, but a really cool article going into um, a little bit more detail on the Basketball Australia coaches website um, around the whole vitamins idea, but we'll touch on that in a little bit. Yep. Yeah, I'll give this slide to Keegs and he can send it out to you guys. Excellent. So we'll talk now a little bit about the five aspects of the Fantastic Five. And the first one is probably the most underlooked skill, an undertaught skill in the whole game of basketball, and that's pivoting and footwork. Why is it the most undertaught skill? If you've heard me do this talk before, don't yell out the answer. Why is it the most undertaught skill? Because it's boring. Who, who is going to get it? If you went, imagine you're coaching your team and you said, right, we're going to practice jump stops for the next five minutes. Whose team's getting excited for that? Your team? Who's, if you, right, we're going to practice reverse pivots. Who's getting excited for that? No one. I don't even get excited thinking about it. So, but it's still super important. Why is footwork important? Hey? Yep, so you can evade your player. Excellent. What else? Yeah. Yep. 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 Every single, every single skill we spoke about there starts with footwork. If you want to be a good shooter, you've got to have a good base. If you want to be, be able to pass, you've got to be able to step through. If you are a dribbler or a ball handler, you need to be able to evade your players. If you're a defender, Literally, the whole job of defense is footwork and pivoting. So it's super important skill, but it's also the most boring skill. See how this could be a little bit of an issue now? So how can you as coaches teach pivoting and footwork? Love it. So by incorporating other skills, which are more fun, but focusing on a footwork base, super important. And I guess to show the importance of it, at the Wildcats, we probably do, I would say, 30 minutes of pivoting and footwork, just pivoting and footwork, a week. And that's guys who have grown up their whole life and are pretty good at it. Um, but we still touch base with that stuff because it is so important and it is the fundamental basis of every other skill that's going through. Really quickly, what are some basic types of footwork that we use in the game of basketball? We've spoken about a few. There was jump stops, reverse pivots. What else? Jab steps, stride stop. Drive to the ring, defensive slides. Layup footwork, closeouts. So there's lots and lots of different types. Again, we could sit here and talk about this for an hour, but just as teaching pivoting and stuff is boring, I'm sure if we sat here and spoke about all these different types, you guys would get pretty bored as well. So, But there is some really good resources that we'll talk about in a little bit um, that are going to help you simplify the way that you um, teach pivoting and footwork. Okay, but the number one most important thing is when you incorporate it with other skills, still practice dribbling, but focus on the footwork. Still practice shooting, but focus on the footwork because all of the other skills start with the feet. Okay? Dribbling or ball handling. Okay? What are some things that are important? Well, I'll rephrase that. We want... Ball control first and foremost. Why is ball control important? Make the right decision. So we have less turnovers, yep. Confidence, yep. The ability to do more stuff on the basketball court. How many times do we see young athletes catch a basketball and go like that? all the time, okay? That's okay because they don't have that ball control and the confidence to be dribbling like that, okay? 
So it's our job as a coach to make sure that they get that ball control. Why do we think dexterity is important as well? Anyone know what dexterity means? Yep, left, right. So your ability to do everything both with your right hand and your left hand. And especially nowadays, the game is getting faster and the game is becoming a lot more fluid. So you need to be able to play on both sides of your body with your right and your left hand. And when you're teaching ball handling and you're practicing it and you're um, drilling it and your vitamins and whatnot, making sure that you're always putting a focus on the offhand as well. Because you think about it, we spoke before about you only get 45 minutes with these guys. But they probably go home and they play for 45 minutes there and then 45 and 45 and blah, blah, blah. But when they're at home, which hand do you think they're dribbling with? Dominant hand. Guarantee every single time they're going there and they're dribbling with their dominant hand. So as a coach, focus on the other hand. Focus a lot more on the other hand because by the time they reach 10, 11, 12, 13, whatever age they are when they've had a basketball in their hands for a few years, they're actually going to be pretty good at dribbling with their right hand. But going over to the left is going to be a bit of an issue. Okay, so as a coach, focusing on that left hand. And again, defenses, as we spoke about the game becoming more fluid, defenses are also getting smarter. And a very, very common defensive trend is just pushing guys on their off hand. Maybe not so much at a grassroots level, but as soon as your kids hit wobble, they hit under 12s, under 14s. I know for a fact there are wobble coaches out there that say, let's just push everyone left. Why would they do that? Because they can't dribble. Can't drive on that side. And all of a sudden, if you've got a kid who's going this way, by dribbling with their inside hand, what's going to happen? Still, turnover. And it's your job as a coach to try and limit the amount of weaknesses or areas of weakness that your athletes have. And a really, really big one is their ability to dribble and pass with their left hand, okay? And look, lastly, once you do start getting pretty good at that, it gives you the confidence to perform your skills under, under pressure and under speed. How many people in the room have an athlete that's really good at doing all this stuff? They can sit there and dribble and do the wraps and the, between the legs and everything until the cow comes home. And then you put a defender on them and it bounces away. Who's got an athlete like that? Yep. So it's important to be able to practice it, but then also practice it under pressure and at speed. Because essentially the game is under pressure and at speed as well. Okay? Any questions or anything on ball handling? Perfect. Who said that phrase before? One of these two phrases before. We had, yep, this morning, yep. Who's had one of those, yeah, literally this weekend, who said we've had way too many turnovers or we need to make sure we look after the ball? Happens all the time, okay? Give you the hint, we said it last night during our game against Adelaide. There was a phrase where we turned the ball over and over and over again and we said we need to make sure we look after the ball more. So it's a common thing at all levels of basketball. How do we do that? How do we make sure that we that we minimize our turnovers or we look after the ball better? How, what's something that you can do at practice to help minimize those things in a game? Yep, fast pace. Yeah, passing under pressure with a defender. Again, technique stuff, and I probably shouldn't say this, Keegs, but the old way of having my hit myself here and Gordon over there and we're just going to path back and forth, back and forth, doing that, that's almost irrelevant nowadays because very, very rarely in a game of basketball do you get the chance to catch it, get your hands set, push forward and shoot like that and pass like that. Very rarely do you get to do that, okay? What's more applicable is me catching the ball here with a defender and having to step around and pass like that. So when you are teaching passing, yes, doing this is important because it gives you the ball skill, especially in young athletes. But once they start to get comfortable with that, add a defender in. Add movement in. 
So you have to time your pass. Or you have to dribble and pick the ball up and make a pass from there. Because generally that's where a lot of the turnovers come from in a game. Is either we've got pressure on us and we can't make the pass. Someone's running and we either throw it behind or throw it too far in front. Or we're going off the dribble and we can't pick it up and throw it on time and on target. Yep, you're up. So that's a really good way of um, giving you guys more confidence in the way that they pass. Okay. What's the other part of passing that isn't really spoken about, but it's very important? Yeah, catching. Okay, especially in young grassroots athlete. How many, how many coaches here have an athlete who goes like this every time they try and catch? Happens. Okay. So what's a way that you can help that athlete become more confident in catching the basketball? Hmm? Yep. Practice. Yep. What else? Yep. Make them harder. Be very careful doing that because if they can't catch it and you throw and you're throwing a basketball at a kid that smacks him in the face you could also use a smaller basketball you could get a softer basketball you could even do get them to hold that this is really young kids get them to hold their hands up and literally just go and place the basketball in their hand so they practice getting their hands on the ball and pulling it out of your hands as well okay but yeah catching is also very important We'll really quickly touch on it. What are some things that we should be teaching if we're teaching someone how to catch? Balance, yep. Stepping into it, yep. Where do we want to catch it? Yeah, chest. What if you punch it over there? Yeah, now hand, whereabouts? Hand, catch it. The palm? Or yeah, generally with our fingers, and we want to try and Catch it with our eyes. Okay, make sure your eyes are on the basketball so you can catch it. I'm running a little bit behind time, so I'll try and uh, get through this. Shooting. I've broken it up into two different types of shooting. Okay, layups and jump shots. Okay, we'll really quickly touch on the layups. Another little phrase. Who said the phrase before? If only we had made some more layups, we would have won. Who said that phrase this weekend? Yep happens all the time to us, okay? So it's a very, very important skill. And it's a tough one though, because what do kids wanna do when they've got the ball? Shoot, they wanna shoot, okay? Who gets excited? All right, we're gonna go and do layups for five minutes. Which teams get excited for that? Not really. Some of the young kids, yes, they will get excited for it. As we move up, okay, once you hit under 12s, under 14s, those kids don't wanna be doing layups. They wanna be shooting freaks. Okay, but it's still very important. It's the highest percentage shot in basketball is a lap. So we need to make sure that we're practicing it. Okay, and we spoke earlier with dribbling. Chances are your athlete's going to be pretty good on their right hand after three or four years of playing basketball because they're going to go home, they're going to practice in the backyard. I guarantee every single shot they take is going to be with their dominant hand. So you as a coach, it's important to be working with your left hand as well. Okay, we spoke earlier with dribbling that basketball is becoming such a fluid game and teams are going to push you towards your weaknesses. If you can't finish with your left hand, then that becomes a real problem, not so much at the grassroots level, but once they reach a wobble team, the team's are going to start to push and they're not going to foul on a left hand layup because they know you're going to miss it more times than not. Kids sometimes can't make a left hand and can't finish with their left hand around the rim. Could be the difference between them making a state team and missing a state team. Okay, so it's very important. And it's something that's tough to teach later in life. It's a lot easier to give them the foundations and the groundwork nice and early. Okay. Finally, how do we make it fun? Like if... We want to, again, whose team's getting excited to do layup lines for five minutes, like a warm up? You're going to get pretty bored after a while. So, how do we make it fun? Yep. Yep, make it a competition. Excellent. Kids love competition. Everyone loves competition. OK, 
okay? So make it competitive. Let's put two minutes on the, on the board and see who can get the most layups in two minutes. Love it. What else? Yep. What's a layup killer? Okay, cool. Like it. What else? Yeah, put a defender in. You know a great way to teach layups? Play one-on-one. -on -one. Because I can guarantee that most of our kids aren't the good defenders at the moment, just the way um, basketball is. So chances are we're going to be getting lots of layups, aren't we? And by putting that extra defender in there, they have to work a little bit on their ball handling, a little bit on their footwork, and then working on finishing with a layup. Okay? Again, I'm very cognizant of time, so I'll move on, but there's lots of stuff that I can show you afterwards around layups. We'll move to the more fun stuff. Jump shot. The jump shot nowadays in basketball is a must skill. If you have five guys on the court that can all make a jump shot, you're going to be a very, very good basketball team, regardless of anything else. Think about, imagine that I'm an alien. All right, I've come down from outer space. And I just want to be taught how to shoot a jump shot. Tell me some things that you want me to do. Yep. Yep. What specifics? What do I what do I need to do? Straight arm. Cool. What else? Pocket. So like that. Cool. Fingers on the ball. Like that. Spin on the ball. Yep. What else? Follow through. What else? Balance. How do I get balance? Footwork. So specifics. Eyes on the way. I want to shoot. Square my shoulders. What about my hips? Who's seen someone shoot a shot like that? Yep. Where do we want our hips? Square. What about my feet? Shoulder width apart. Yep. What about my guide hand? Lots of stuff, isn't there? Who can remember everything that we just said? No one. Okay. I can't even remember, to be honest. So... If there's lots of different aspects of shooting that we need to focus on, and we're going to go through, okay, you need to have your feet square, you need to bend your knees, you need to have your hips square, you need this hand on top, you need this hand on the side, elbow in, up, shoot. How many of our athletes are geniuses and they can remember every single one of those, every single shot in a game? None of us. So what's important to teach? Consistency, yeah. Yeah. Consistency is a big one. What are, let's think about some of the greatest shooters that you guys know. What are some commonalities with all of them? Yeah, same routine. Every shot looks the same. Good base. Yep, they all have a really good base. That's a great start. So let's focus on that. We need a great base. So when you're teaching your athletes to shoot, Make sure it starts with their feet. We spoke about earlier with footwork and pivoting. Every single skill starts at the feet. So let's make sure we have a good base. What else? Soft touch. Cool. Soft touch. How do we get that soft touch? Backspin on the ball. Yep. Lots of arc. They say that with a good jump shot, it needs to do three things. First and foremost, it needs to go straight. Then it needs to go up, and lastly, it needs to go long. Okay, so every shot that we take, first and foremost, needs to be straight. How do we get it straight? Through our feet and our follow through. Everything else is irrelevant for making it straight. Our feet and our follow through, making sure they're both pointing at the ring. We then need to make our shot go up. How do we do that? Yep, our legs first and foremost, and our follow-through, pushing the ball up. Lastly, we need it to go long. How do we make it go long? Yep, arms. I'll give you a hint, we've spoken about it already. Our feet, by getting rhythm, and our follow-through, by snapping our wrist and pushing it out long. So if you're going to focus on something, we spoke earlier about keeping it simple, Focus on the feet and focus on the follow through. Everything else at the moment is irrelevant. Especially 
in grassroots athletes where some of them don't have the power to shoot it one-handed like that from the perimeter. Who's got an athlete that shoots it like this with two hands? Yep, is that okay? Yeah. If they can't physically do it like this, do we tell them not to shoot a basketball? No. So focusing on the feet, getting that balanced, and follow through. And if that's a follow through with two hands, that's okay. That's okay. Get them getting that arm up there. And then once they get a little bit stronger, you can start to bring this arm back down. Okay? Again, we can talk about shooting for literally hours and hours and hours. Um, the last thing that I will say, keep it simple. Be consistent in your message. This is a trap that lots of coaches get stuck into because they'll see their athletes shoot a shot and their elbow will be sticking out. So you say, hey, make sure you get your elbow in. So then they get their elbow in, but they forget about their feet. And then you go, hey, next time, make sure your feet are balanced. All right, cool. Then they get their feet balanced. And then their next shot is going flat. And you go, man, make sure you get your follow through up. Okay, I'm going to get my follow through up. And then the elbow goes back out. And then you start talking about the elbow again. And you're not achieving anything by doing that. So keeping it simple and be consistent in your message. We spoke earlier about vitamins. Sometimes we'll go and do a vitamin session where all we'll focus on is our landing. So we want guys to go up and shoot and we want them to stick their landing and wait. And that's all we'll talk about. We won't talk about follow through, we won't talk about elbow, we won't talk about any of that. Just their feet. Because we want to be consistent in our message and get better at that. The last one really quickly we'll speak about Form shooting versus repetition shooting versus situational shooting, okay? Does anyone here do form shooting at their practices? So form shooting is literally get the ball out, practice your technique nice and close to the basket, working on that, all right? If you do that, excellent. That's really good, okay? From there, you move out into repetitions. So once we've worked a little bit on our form, we just want to get reps shooting the basketball. Okay, and then lastly, we want to make it situational. We want to add a defender in. We want to add them going off a cut. We want to build in some decision making into our shooting. And all three all three phases are very important. Okay, and it's your job as a coach to navigate through those different situations. Again, we could talk about it for hours, but um, I will leave it there, but I'll give you some resources and stuff at the end that could help you with that. Lastly, if shooting is the master skill, one-on-one -on -one defense is the most important skill. We spoke earlier about if you have five guys on the court that can all shoot a basketball, the flip side of that, if you have five players on the court that can all defend their man, you're going to be a very, very good team, regardless of anything else. And we're very lucky here at the Cats that we have probably one of the greatest defenders of all time in Damian Martin around us. And it's pretty impressive watching him train and the way he approaches his defense. But I spoke to him about it and said, why are you so good? Like, what, what makes you better than player X, player Y, player Z? And he came up with three things. The first thing was that he just wanted to be a great defender. For him, it's all a mindset. Why do we think your mindset is very important when playing defense? Confidence, yep. Effort. Because it's bloody hard. Going out and playing defense and chasing offensive players around and doing the stuff that he does is exceptionally difficult and tiring. And if you don't want to do it, you're not going to do it. So that's the first thing. Before we can get into any technique stuff, you have to want to be a good defender. And if you want to be a good defender, then that's half the battle. And that's his thing, is he wants to be a good defender. I've seen him, after practice, play one-on-one -on -one with Bryce Cotton, but he doesn't touch the basketball. He just plays one-on-one -on -one for 10 minutes, just playing defense. Now, 
I don't know about you guys, but I can't think of literally anything worse than trying to defend Bryce Cotton for 10 minutes straight without touching a basketball. But that's what his mentality is. He wants to be a great defender, and by going up against the best offensive player in the league, that's going to help him become a great defender. Okay? The second thing is he can be in a stance for 24 seconds. 24 seconds is the shot clock, and he can stay in a stance for that whole time. I'm not going to do it, but normally I would make you guys stand up and go down in a stance and see how long we can last. Okay, I'm not going to do it myself because I'll last three seconds and then I'll probably pull a hammy or something like that as well. But your ability to stay in it, hey, the stance, it's like that, down there like that, okay? But I'm already feeling my hammy starting to hurt, so. Um, but he can stay in the stance for 24 seconds. And by being in a stance, he's a lot more mobile and he can get from A to B to C and he can pivot and he can change and cut off angles and do all that stuff that he does. But that's really difficult. So you have to want to be able to do it. The third thing is his hands never, ever, ever go below his waist. How many times do you see defenders where you go, okay, get into defensive stance and they go like this. Who's had an athlete do that before? Yep, it happens all the time, which is fine. They call it aeroplane defense now. We don't want aeroplane defense. Why might we not want that? Hmm? Yeah. If shooting's the master skill and we're defending like this, what's a good shooter going to do? They're just going to see straight away at the basket and knock it down. So Damo's very good. He never, ever puts his hands below his waist. They're always doing something. They might be tracing the ball, they might be getting deflections, they might be doing whatever, but they're always up and about, okay? We spoke about making it fun. Playing defense sucks. It's hard work. If we're going to go and do, right, we're going to do closeouts and slide and slide and slide, whose athletes are getting excited about that? No one's. So how do we make it fun? What can we do? Yep. Add some shooting into it, make it fun. We touched on it a little bit earlier. What's the best way to teach individual defense? Competition. What does the best defender in the league do to practice his defense? Plays one-on-one. -on -one. Plays one-on-one -on -one again, okay? One thing that's, I guess, getting less and less of in junior athletes nowadays is they don't play as much one-on-one. -on -one. Because they're doing so much basketball, they've got school basketball, Domestic basketball, um, wobble basketball, they've got this, they've got that, they're going to holiday camps, they're going to clinics, they're doing all this. They don't have time just to go and muck around with their mates and play one-on-one. -on -one. But sometimes that's where some of the best learning happens. So I would always, if I was coaching a grassroots team, I would always have a 15, 20 minute block of just playing one-on-one. -on -one. Because you can practice so many different elements of the Fantastic Five and the biggest one being your individual defense, okay? And lastly, Jacob will speak next, but he can attest to this. That's been our message all year at the Wildcats. We are the number one defensive team in the league, and that's what it boils down to. It boils down to squaring the basketball up and guarding your yard. And by yard, it's one step this way, one step this way. You want to know what the secret to it is? That's what it is. Squaring the basketball up, guarding your yard. I won't speak too much more about that because Jacob's going to go about that next. Really quickly, some resources that can help you as a coach. Okay, the first one is the Basketball WA Facebook coaches page. Is anyone not on that at the moment? If you're not, make sure you see kegs and jump on that one there. They put clinics, they put articles, they put all sorts of really good stuff out there, um, and that's very good. I'm biased to this next one, Basketball WA YouTube page, because I used to run it when I was working in Keegs' job, but there's all these clinics and talks and stuff like that that Basketball WA do, and it's a great resource to listen to different coaches um, share the game, basically. Okay. Basketball Australia also have a coaches page. It's coach.basketball .net.au. Again, Keggs will send that through later to you. But that's essentially the Basketball Australia version of what the guys at Basketball WA are doing. 
okay? And it's got great articles. That's where they share all their clinics that they do Australia-wide. Another great resource for getting some new drills and some new ideas. The last one probably gets a little bit underlooked, but that's the FIBA Coaches Manual, okay? That's, we spoke about um, a curriculum before. That's a very simplified version of a curriculum, but it's got drills, it's got teaching points, it's got all the boring stuff that sometimes gets forgotten. It's got all that stuff on there. So that's a really good, um, a really good resource for you, okay? Finally though, the number one resource is other coaches. One thing I've learned is coaches love talking about themselves and their teams. So don't be afraid. If you see someone here that is running really good individual defense, they've just got guys on the court that can all defend, go over and talk to them and say, G'day, I just want to know how, how are your team so good at defense? First of all, they're going to pick their chest up and be all happy, but then they'll talk for 10, 15, 20 minutes about the different stuff that they do at practice. And other coaches are really good if you're having issues. If you're having a problem with such and such, I guarantee you there's five other coaches in the room, five other coaches within your network that are either having the same problem or have had that problem and have a situation and have a solution for it. Okay, the best thing that you can do is just talk to other coaches. Thank you.